for this premiere episode of our online video magazine looking at mining issues and the history of mining in Arizona. You know, Arizona is regularly the number one or number two mining state in the United States and one of the largest drivers historically of the Arizona economy. In fact, two-thirds of all the copper produced and used in the United States comes from Arizona. So as part of our 125th anniversary here at the Arizona Survey, we're launching something new to help us better carry out one of our statutory missions, which is to serve as the primary source of geologic information to enhance public understanding of the state's mining and mineral resources. So along those lines, Arizona Mining Review is going to explore the state of mining in Arizona, the challenges, successes. We're going to go from potash to copper to gold to industrial minerals, from exploration to policy development. We're going to be talking with experts from industry, academia, government, um, and politics, and to discuss the current state and the future of mining in Arizona. So in our inaugural broadcast today, we're going to be joined by Niall Nemeth, the chief of our economic geology section in Phoenix, and get an overview of what to look forward to in the rest of 2013 of, of what's happening in the mining sector. And Niall and I are going to take a look at uh, the landscape for this coming year. Where do we stand with copper, gold, silver, and some of the other uh, minerals that are being explored, and developed here in the state? And we have featured guests today. Peter McGaw from the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society is in the studio, and he'll be followed by Jane Roxbury from the uh, Metropolitan Tucson Convention and Visitors Bureau to find out more about the upcoming Tucson Gem and Mineral Showcase and the, uh, the classic uh, Gem and Mineral Show. And then we're going to wrap up uh, at the end of our 30 minutes today with Janelle D uh, Day, our survey GIS and data manager, who's going to demo our new online interactive maps of Arizona mines. So let's turn to Niall up in the Phoenix branch and get a preview of what to expect in the mining sector in 2013. Niall, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks, Lee. Good. We're glad uh, you're online here. Uh, I'm eager to hear what you think are going to be the hot developments coming up uh, in this year. But before we get into that, I understand you've got some new numbers on mining claims in Arizona. Uh, what's, what's happening there? You know, one of the indicators of the strength of exploration and mining estate typically is the number of federal mining claims that are held. I was curious after the turn of the year to see how some of last year's events have affected that number after people had made their assessment filings and their uh, maintenance fee claim payments. I was surprised to learn that the number of claims had jumped from 43,600 to well over 49,000 uh, claims. That includes all types, load, placer, mill site, and tunnel site. There are a number of reasons why I was expecting the, uh, the claim totals to drop. We had the bad decision, in my opinion, by Secretary of Interior Salazar affecting the emergency withdrawal on the plateau that affected a lot of the uranium explorers and miners. We had had uh, an increase to a fee for every 20 acres of association placer claims. And then it's just been a, a common thing reported to me by many Canadian juniors that they've had difficulty raising money for their projects. And so I thought those three would result in a drop. Uh, so what we might uh, wonder led to the, uh, the surprising increase. I guess I'd attribute that to two factors. Uh, we've had quite a rebound in the economy. I sense that by the clientele I see, uh, just the general uh, number of cars on, on the traffic here in Phoenix. So I think a lot of people are feeling more confident, entrepreneurial to go out and either be working on their own claims or that they'll be able soon to sell those. One of the reasons they might be able to sell them is we've also seen uh, a strong continued gold price well over $1,600 per ounce. Uh, now, when was the last time we had that number of claims uh, here in Arizona? We've approached this, uh, you know, high 40,000 number just before the recession began in 2008. But if we look at a longer perspective, back when uh, the entire plateau was still open game and people were very excited about the new models and the potential for the breccia pipe uh, uranium mineralized breccia pipes on the Colorado Plateau, we had seen as high as 140,000 claims. But that would have been way back in the 1980s. I see. Okay. Well, let's move on. Uh, you know, Arizona's the copper state, and I know there's a number of both greenfield and brownfield uh, projects underway. 
and a lot of expansion of existing mines. So what do you see happening this year? Uh, one thing we might do is take a brief look back at some of the production tables. I've not been able to get the 2012 uh, numbers. We'll look forward to doing that in a future uh, monthly Arizona mining review. But we have seen over the last couple of years an uh, increase in production. A uh, fair amount of that's attributed to uh, we've got Safford coming on for a few years now. We've had the expansion at Mineral Park with their mill going in incremental steps from coming on at 25,000 tons per day. Uh, stepping through all the way up to 50,000 tons per day. And so that's becoming one of our, uh, not top six, but still one of our, our larger uh, producers. We've also anticipated this year we'll have a number of uh, hopefully good uh, news developments. We're all expecting to see the environmental impact statement released for Augusta's Rosemont project down in southern Arizona. We've got a smaller project that's just north of Tucson in the Catalina Mountains. That's Oracle Ridge's Oracle Ridge mine, which uh, will be a small underground conventional concentration flotation mill project. Uh, we've also got expansions ongoing at existing producers. We've got a very large expansion being worked on by Freeport McMoran and Sumitomo at Morenci. That's anticipated to increase production there 30%. That's especially significant for the state as Marinci is by far and away the largest producer of copper in the state. We've got expansions going on at the Mission Mine of Asarco, which will not only increase the tonnage mined and milled, but also bring molybdenum production back. And then just recently, at the end of the last year, we've had BHP restart the Pinto Valley uh, open pit mine and concentrator, and that'll add to the existing production that occurs from the in situ leach from the old Miami Block Cave. Wow, that's impressive. Um, what's happening besides copper? What are the, where, where are the next big uh, plays coming along that you see? Well, we might we might stay on copper just for a minute and okay. touch on a couple other projects. Uh, we've had some good news and some bad news. We've had curious resources uh, continue to go forward despite some of their setbacks for their overall project where they plan to work on bringing online a test on the state portion of their Florence deposit. Uh, hopefully we can get to that detailed map uh, showing some of the central Arizona uh, projects. We've got Florence Resolution Copper on that. Uh, speaking of Resolution Copper, we've had a bit of a setback there. The company is currently just completing the, the sinking of the number 10 shaft. That shaft has gone down to 6,950 feet. Uh, but because they haven't been able to get Congress to approve their land exchange, they're going to uh, slow down their development activities. Anyways, with that, I guess we I feel like we've kind of wrapped up at least a brief review of copper until we get to it in more detail in the future. Right. I think we're going to come back in one of our future episodes and really dive into copper in great detail because it's such an important part of the, uh, the mining sector here. But so uh, I know there's a lot of activity going on in gold, silver, there's exploration for uh, rare earths, for, uh, uranium, uh, iron ore, manganese. Uh, what do you see as the hot topics for the rest of the year? You know, the thing that always excites both the lay public, investors, and certainly the, uh, the mining community is gold. Right. Uh, for two years now, we've had one project up in the Oatman District, that'd be the Gold Road Mine of Mojave Desert Minerals in production. A uh, bit of bad news there, they're running out of developed and identified ore underground, so they're currently processing tailings from the United Eastern Mine. It's keeping their mill busy, probably uh, also rapidly adding to the tonnage in their uh, tailings dam. Luckily they're doing that uh, dry stack process. That's the first mine I'm aware of in the state that's done that, and that's the technology we'll see executed down at the Rosemont project. We've also seen a year now production from American Bonanza's Copperstone project. They are now developing that as an underground mine and that's been why that's slowly ramping up. Last year they took over the underground uh, operations and fired their contractor. So they've hired staff, bought equipment and have been ramping up the number of developed headings so they can feed their 400 ton per day gravity and flotation mill. Uh, seems like they've got their production tonnage up. Uh, we're waiting to see if they can get their grade up to the resource level of about a third of an ounce. 
We've got one other small project that seems to be slowly moving towards uh, developing a mill, and that would be the Fancher, also known as the Bronco Verdstone Oakland out on the La Paz Yuma County line. Uh, that'll be a small mine, and they hope to have a facility to mill that near Salome on private land. We've got two other projects that are pretty exciting on the exploration front. Up in the Oakland District again, there's a open pit uh, project that will have some pilot production, we hope, late this year. The company have been drilling the last couple of years. That's the Northern Vertex project. They hope to, uh, when they get their feasibility studies done, announce that they have nearly a million ounce gold equivalent. So that would be by far the largest gold resource in the state. Uh, closer to Phoenix, just up by Wickenburg, we've got Bullfrog Gold aggressively drilling out the Newsboy. They have identified uh, some historic resources that they've been adding to. They've got some outlying satellite targets they hope to test. When they get through their third and fourth drill stages, they uh, hope to put together a mine model and begin permitting. Uh, they've currently got about 250,000 ounces in their geologic resource. Wow. Sounds like there's uh, going to be a, a lot to watch here for this coming year. Something we might ask the audience to do if they haven't already. Uh, in the late summer, early fall, there was a new article put on our Arizona Geology magazine. You can hit the AZGS website and look under publications to find that. It does a review of a number of other gold projects that are actively being explored in the state. Okay, great. Niall, thanks. We're going to have you back probably every month to uh, kind of update what's news and what's happening and get your insights. So thanks for joining us today. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about, mentioned Rare Earths very briefly, but in recent months we've been hearing more and more news about companies uh, kind of quietly exploring for air, air, uh, rare earths around the state and, and uh, suggesting that there might be a couple of discoveries uh, about to be announced. I think one of the problems we've had in the past is we just haven't had the kind of statewide assessments here across Arizona that we've had in places like New Mexico. So uh, I think we may be looking at, uh, at rare earths as a topic to, to delve into in a future episode. So now let's turn to our first guest, uh, Peter McGaw, Tucson-based exploration geologist and miner uh, and a leading authority on minerals, and he's here today to represent the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society. Peter, welcome. Glad you could join us. Thanks, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here, especially as a product of uh, <laughs> the excellent economic geology program here at the <laughs> University of Arizona. It's fun to be on your premier oh, show. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, the 59th show is coming up here in a few weeks, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people have been surprised to see what the mineral theme is for this year. And can you tell us what that is and why it was chosen? Well, our, our theme fo focus changes annually, either from a mineral species or a geographic location um, or a type of deposit, an element, for example, copper mineral, mentioning tie into what right. you were talking about earlier. Uh, last year we celebrated the 100th anniversary of Arizona statehood with Arizona related cases. This year we decided to go to a mineral called fluorite, uh, and fluorite was chosen because it occurs in a very broad range of geologic environments, has a wonderful range of crystallographic habits and shapes and occurs in virtually every color of the rainbow. And, and on top of that, exhibits a number of interesting effects with different kinds of light. Sometimes it's phosphorescent, sometimes it's fluorescent, sometimes it's a different color and different light. Uh, so just fluorite, something that is probably one of the most popular collector minerals and just oh, something yeah. we decided to feature. Okay, great. Well, I know every year there's always buzz about something new that's coming along, that a new specimen that's been uncovered or a new locale that's being dug into. Have you got any advance word of things that, that may be coming this year we ought to be looking for? Oh, absolutely. This year an amazing find of a mineral called crocoite, which is a lead chromate that occurs in Tasmania primarily. Uh, the, the, the Adelaide and Red Lead mine in Tasmania, they found an enormous pocket, a walk-in size pocket, and these are brilliant red crystals up to about that long that occur in these big pin cushions or porcupines if you'd like. Uh, and it was a huge find absolutely spectacular color, unquestionably the best find of the mineral ever, uh, and just in huge quantities. So there should be a number of really superb uh, samples of that available for collectors. Right, and these are all going to be affordable for people like me, right? <laughs> I'm sure there'll be something for everyone. <laughs> okay. Excellent. 
Uh, you know, Peter, uh, I know you've got an incredible personal collection. I've had the chance to see it. And what are you looking for, particularly this year, personally, that you think is going to be uh, so exciting, besides what you just described? Well, my collection is focused on minerals of Mexico, partially because that's where I work a lot and because that's our neighbor immediately to the yeah. south. So. Uh, I always look to see what's amazing and new out of Mexico, and this year there was a wonderful find of wolfenite associated with a mineral called matramite from the Ojuela mine in uh, Durango, Mexico, and some very nice pieces of that have been coming out, as well as some beautiful fluorites from Mexico. So we get to tie in Mexico with the theme pretty nicely. Okay, excellent. You know, uh, it's always surprising, I think, to people to understand that the show didn't pop into existence like it is today. Going back 59 years, this started out in a, in a school cafeteria. It started out in a grade school cafeteria right. with about four dealers and about a dozen exhibitors. Uh, it graduated to the fairgrounds, uh, which involved, uh, well, we followed a, a, a cattle show, so you can imagine <laughs> what it involved. Uh, and then we were actually the first occupants of the first Tucson Convention Center. Uh, or community center, it was called then, and we were also the first occupants of the recently, or relatively recently, remodeled uh, Tucson Convention Center. So we've been there, remembering that we are a local, all-volunteer, nonprofit, hobby-based organization. We are the only show that runs on that basis in town, dedicated to earth science education for the public in general, and a high percentage of our profits are plowed back into earth science education and mineralogical education at the grade school, high school, and university levels right here in Tucson. Wow, fantastic. And I'm aware of the education programs. You've also got a lecture series and a number of big names coming in from around the world here. And uh, is, is there any uh, anybody that that you want to showcase right now or suggest? Uh, I'm not probably not as familiar with the speaker okay. program <laughs> as I should be, but uh, okay. we do run a whole series of, of lectures run both by the society where we bring in featured speakers, but also the Friends of Mineralogy have a symposium uh, where they bring in mineral scientists from all over the world. Uh, and so those programs run essentially simultaneously with the show on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and okay. your ticket of admission gets you into all of those talks, uh, children under 14 are admitted free. They're welcome to participate in the junior education program where we work with undergraduate students from the University of Arizona who interact with the kids to teach them about mineralogy. They give them a, a, a treasure hunt where they go out, uh, which is designed basically to lead them to certain exhibits so that they get captivated by that exhibit. And when they get finished, they get a few specimens to start their own collections with. Fantastic. Peter? Thank you very much. I'm really excited about this show coming up, and I expect I'll see you on the convention uh, floor there in a few weeks. I certainly expect to be there. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Lee. All right. Um, next on our program is Jane Roxbury from the Metropolitan Tucson Convention and Visitors Bureau. Jane, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming over. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what's your job at the Bureau? As Director of Convention Services, I'm responsible okay. for the more than 350 convention planners that bring meetings to Tucson each year. Okay. I provide them direct marketing support, partner connections, and other services. And as such, the owners and promoters of the 40-plus gem, mineral, and fossil shows are within my client portfolio. So I'm communicating okay. with them year-round. Okay. Now, Peter was just telling us about the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show and the Society. But that's very different than the showcase that runs for the two weeks before that. So could you explain a little bit? I think a lot of people confuse the two and think they're all part of the same event. Could you explain the difference between those? Absolutely. So TGMS, the show that started it all, obviously is a nonprofit educational organization that operates year-round uh, in a membership capacity, and they hold events, do publications, as Peter explained. It is the show that started it all, but over the 59 years, many shows have followed. And in the mid-80s, there was a proliferation of shows that came in as the American Gem Trade Association brought their show to Tucson, and the Convention and Visitors Bureau came to be and started serving all these shows and promoting this great Tucson event. Okay. So how big is the showcase now, and, and what's the economic impact in Tucson and Arizona? Well, this year we're looking at 43 shows across the metro area in 41 locations. 
and that represents thousands of vendors serving 55,000 visitors and a $65 million economic impact. And these people are coming in from all over the world, it, it appears. You hear every language right. spoken in the halls. And all these 43 shows, they're each independent, right? They're, they're not integrated under one kind of coordinating body. They're correct. There are some shows that uh, the owners will mul operate multiple shows. Okay. Um, and each business model is slightly different. Okay. Obviously, again, TGMS being a 501c3 nonprofit is different from the American Gem Trade Association in business to serve a particular niche. A lot of gem shows are family owned and operated. Uh -huh. So, okay. wide nice. range. Fantastic. Well, it, it appears that this year the Convention Bureau is doing a lot more to be promoting the show. And I know uh, every year around this time the rumors start flying, uh, you know, here say, oh, you know, we, we're just not doing a good enough job. They're going to move. They're going to go to Vegas or they're going to go to Phoenix, something like that next year. How, how big a threat is that, and what are you doing to make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, it's interesting. Nearly 40% of the shows are locally owned and or locally operated. Uh, and so the notion of the entire entity moving en masse somewhere else is uh, a little far-fetched. I think certainly one or two shows each year relocate or go out of business or decide to take a year off, and that's a natural attrition for the shows. Um, there are shows that operate year-round and go all over North America, Vegas, all of the cities that are in the rumor mill. So okay. they're, they're operating shows there already, and it's just part of their natural business cycle. What we're doing at the Convention and Visitors Bureau, we've launched a new website with a new URL that's easier for users, TucsonJumpShow.org. Oh, and I think we've been able to bring that up on the screen. Yes, here, and you so. have the Great. pretty. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, and then there's also the printed gem guide, which will be at every show, along with new branded racks that hold this guide, as well as visitor information. And any visitor can snap the QR code located on the guide uh, and be directed to our mobile site, which last year oh. had 85,000 views. Wow. So for smartphones? For smartphones. Okay, exactly. excellent, fantastic. Um, Jane, how do local businesses get involved with these shows? Uh, what do you guys do to help them get embedded into this opportunity? We operate a welcome program that has tripled in size over the past few years. There are now 300 businesses involved and they will be displaying a window cling that mirrors this design. This is Peter McGaugh's collection as well. Okay. Um, and uh, also offering potentially special offers to gem show attendees uh, if you show your badge. Um, and businesses can follow me on Twitter at Tucson Gems uh, and learn more about the program. Fantastic. All right. Well, Jane, thank you very much. This is exciting. Uh, we, we're seeing the tents uh, popping up all over town. In fact, from our windows here in downtown Tucson, I think we can see a half a dozen different shows being set up right now. So the excitement is building, and thanks for coming in, and we hope this is going to be a very successful show this year. Thank you, Lee. Okay. Now, the last piece of our program today uh, is going to be a preview by Janelle Day of our new online interactive maps of Arizona mines. So, Janelle is the Geoscience Information Manager here at the Arizona Survey and our GIS guru. Janelle, welcome. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. Uh, you've been building some really cool new online interactive maps, and mm -hmm. they're not public yet, so we're going to preview them today for the first time that people mm -hmm. are going to see them. Okay, so I think we've just brought up on the uh, on the screen here, this looks like the industrial minerals map. So do you want to tell us what you've got here and, and maybe show us how this is going to work? Sure, Lee. Um, I'd be glad to. Uh, what we're looking at here is over 300 mines um, that display the industrial minerals for the state of Arizona. And the idea is that we want to get this information out to more of the Arizona citizens as well as other people that are interested in industrial minerals um, in the nation. And what we're looking at here is maybe about 18 different types of products that are mined here in Arizona. And it looks like it ranges from, I see aggregates, clay, concrete, uh, sand and gravel, perlite, flagstone. So 
It's everything except the uh, kind of the metallic minerals, it looks like. The stuff that's used in construction and day-to-day yes, operations. Yes, okay. that's correct. So is there anything in particular you'd well, like to uh, see? Well, so each of, the, each of the colored dots there uh, corresponds to a color. So the, uh, the, the different colors on the legend then represent the different types of commodities on the map. Yes, exactly. Okay. So now sh you can up at the top. It looks like you've got a search bar. Mm -hmm. So you can you can we can search by uh, commodities or companies. Correct. But but it, it might be easier if I wanted to see say all the sand and gravel quarries on the map. Uh, you would just go down and click on the sand and gravel box, and what happens then? Sure. Well, first I would clear everything that's on the map ah. because there's you know okay. more than 300 <laughs> items on the map. Okay. But then I can go down here, and I'm interested in seeing where all the sand gra sand and gravel mines are. And okay. let's try that one more time, because we're looking at everything now, with the exception of the sand <laughs> <laughs> and the gravel vines. Okay. So here we go. If I click on this button. There we go. Sure. And then okay. if I mouse over each of these bubbles, we can see the name of the mine or the quarry. And depending on what our data contributor gave us, we're going to get different information that's displayed here. Okay. Um, but we definitely want to thank the um, the industrial minerals or the mine inspector's office for giving us this information. Uh -huh. Okay, so yes. Joe Hart at the state mine inspector uh, provided us these locations, and now we're working mm -hmm. with the companies to get additional information. So, uh, do we have any examples where, if you were to what right click on some of these, it brings up additional information, or that's still in development? Um, that's currently still in development, but okay. we have another map that emulates that. Oh. If okay. you'd like to see yeah, that. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Sure. Okay, so right now we're looking at the um, active mines map. So these are the metals that we produce here in Arizona. And, and it looks like down in the lower left you've got each of the major commodities. So mm -hmm. it looks like copper, copper molly, mm -hmm. gold, uranium, and what are the others? Uh, we have cement, coal, and lime. Okay. And right. so what's, um, what's the popular mine here in Arizona? Well, as, as Niall was telling us earlier, the Marenzi mine, Freeport's Marenzi mine, over on the east side of the state is the largest copper mine and mm -hmm. is going to increase by 30% this year with its production. So, yeah, okay, so show us what you've got for Marenzi. Okay, so if I click on this, um, we get a slideshow with different images of operations at the Marenzi mine. Um, and if we're interested in learning a little bit more about what's going on at this mine or a little bit about the company, there's a hyperlink here. And so you can click on it and it will take ah. you to a page that gives you a bit more information about the mine itself. Fantastic. So these are in final proofing testing. It looks like uh, mm -hmm. they're close to being ready to go. When, mm -hmm. when do you think they're going to go public? Um, I would say by the end of this week. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Okay. And we'll announce that on the ACGS website, I assume. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. These tools look great. Janelle, thanks so much for sharing them with us. And uh, that pretty much wraps it up for today. I want to thank all of our guests for coming in. Uh, and we invite you who are watching this to send us your comments, uh, suggestions on things like you'd like to see in, in upcoming shows. Uh, we're going to be delving into each of Arizona's mineral commodities in more detail in the future episodes along with news and interviews uh, from those who are shaping Arizona's mining agenda. So I hope you'll join us in the coming months. So I want to thank our production crew here, Director Mike Conway, technical support from Ron Palmer, set design from Arnie Bermudez, uh, Dennis Carey, and Stephanie Moore, Mar, excuse me, Stephanie, and Jordan Maddy, who's been running the control board and pushing us uh, along today. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next month.